Good morning, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Aileen, for uh, very, very kind words. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here, and frankly, why wouldn't I? I like travelling. Munich's a beautiful city. It's a beautiful day. Amazing venue, right? Great speakers, some super smart speakers. Apollo, super smart speaker. He, he, he also got the memo about the uniform, yeah, the, you know, the, the waistcoat, the blue waistcoat and jacket. Next time we speak together, we just need to make sure everyone else is on the programme. Okay, so... Um, so no, really, really delighted to, to be here, and um, uh, uh, insurance. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit of background. Uh, when I was a, a boy, you know, seven, eight, nine, let's say, I grew up in the countryside, and uh, our house sort of backed onto a, a cornfield, and then there was sort of rambling farmland, uh, and we used to have great adventures in these fields, and I, you know, we talked a bit about senses, didn't we, before, we heard, heard that, and... I can remember sort of running my hands through the cornfields, like in the film Gladiator, uh, and the smells of the yeah, and the and the smells of the seasons and uh, the sounds of the countryside. And we had great adventures, and we pretended that we were warriors, or when we grew up, we were going to be in the army, or police, or adventurers, or go to the moon. And I can tell you honestly, I'm not lying. We never ever thought, let's maybe one day work in insurance. But I guess we didn't know what we didn't know at that point in time. As it turns out, insurance is really fascinating. And I've worked in many sectors, and it's the most interesting by far. Because it helps society to work. Okay. The sharp end of insurance is that last year, our biggest single claim was, uh, I don't, uh, after Brexit, I don't know what's happening with the exchange rate, but about £20 million pounds for a motor insurance claim. How can that be? Well, sadly, tragically, a 17-year-old who put his three best friends into wheelchairs for the rest of their lives. It's about five to eight million pounds for a lifetime of care for a quadriplegic or a tetraplegic. So the sharp end of insurance is pretty sharp. This is people who have been hospitalized after accidents, people who have lost their worldly possessions, their homes have been flooded. This is about correcting loss. And if you didn't have insurance, society wouldn't work. If you crashed a car every time you had to buy a new one, you wouldn't buy a car. If when your house burnt down, you had to build a new one, you wouldn't buy a house, and so on and so forth. So I'm a bit of a convert, and maybe when I was playing in those fields all those years ago, I should have thought, hey, maybe I should go and work in insurance. Anyway, we live and learn. So it was particularly fascinating for me to move into insurance about five years ago, um, because insurance in the UK, and I think in many markets, had lost its way lost its way. Why do I say that? Well, the fixation upon, upon the process of getting insured and the price I'm paying had completely obscured, like a solar eclipse, completely obscured what insurance is all about. Insurance is about the point of need. When things go wrong, how does it perform? That had been completely lost. In the UK, when we survey people who have just bought insurance and we ask them a question, do you know what you have bought? About a quarter say no. They know the price they've paid, but they don't know what they bought. And I just had a good conversation with Tony before. He said, I just had to make an insurance claim, flooded my, my cellar, uh, and I looked up, and, and, and thankfully I was covered. Well, 25% of people don't know what they bought. That's massively undercalled because people don't want to say they're stupid in surveys. Uh, and so, like, imagine I go in to buy a nice new mobile uh, BMW car, I pay the price, I put the key in the ignition. I forgot to ask if it had an engine. Oh, silly me. Well, people are buying insurance not knowing what they've bought. It's crazy, and it's not exactly cheap. So insurance had lost its way. It was really a broken industry. And actually, the business I was in was a bit of a broken business. And it was for sure a broken marketing team. And it was definitely a broken brand. We were declining at double digit. And lo and behold, the answer to all this is fixing. You couldn't make it up. That golden thread where the customer, unmet customer need is what fixes the brand, fixes the marketing team, fixes the business, fixes the sector. So this is a story about fixing, but with a twist in about how we've used technology to demonstrate that on a, world, a worldwide stage and on a bigger stage outside of the insurance context. So I'm going to take you uh, through a story about do drones, um, what it's done for the business, a bit of why we did it, uh, and also some of the learnings that may be uh, generalizable and you can take with you. Okay, um, who can name the actor? Hollywood's in a bit of trouble right now, but anyway, who can name 
The actor. Harvey Keitel, of course. Who can name the character? Winston Wolfe, the wolf. The ultimate fixer. And the film? Pulp Fiction. So put your hand up if you've seen the film Pulp Fiction. Okay, so that's good. So I don't have to do a whole... For those who haven't seen it, all I say is watch it. It's one of the most iconic films. This is one of the most iconic characters and actors in the world. Uh, and he happens to be the spokesperson for our, our advertising. Which is an unusual choice, maybe, to have a gangster who cleans the brains up of Marvin when he's been shot in the head in the back of the car as a spokesperson for the least trusted sector in the world, yeah, that might be an unusual decision. Sorry, by least trusted, I mean insurance is the least trusted sector in the UK. Uh, sadly, the UK are the least trusting people in the world. Maybe that's how the hell we got to Brexit. I don't know, don't get me started. <laughs> but he is a fantastic metaphor for our intent to be a fixer. He very elegantly, quickly, simply makes really messy problems go away. Right, okay. It may be the brains off the back of a seat, I grant you. But he's a great metaphor for our intent to be a fixer. And he's great at fixing. He does a fantastic job. Uh, and so, in 2014, we relaunched the brand with this guy as our spokesperson. And we set about sort of righting the wrong, putting the point of need back into focus. Uh, and so we launched a number of market-leading propositions, which basically say, that here's our integrity as a fixer. So, f for example, um, if you've got gallons of water gushing out your pipes and you ring up your insurance company I don't know if it's the same in Germany but in the UK your insurance company would say mm, yeah, that's really interesting just call us back when you want to make a claim okay but but you know the plumbers right yeah yeah but we only we only fix it afterwards you know we don't so we've now launched a proposition where we'll get you an emergency plumber within two hours this is simple stuff this isn't rocket science the rocket science or the drone science is to come this is just the build-up uh, I might it might take weeks for my car to get repaired We'll guarantee we'll do it in seven days. Or we'll, we'll find ourselves if we don't. Uh, my, my mobile phone's lost. It might take days. I mean, what's that all about? We look at them three, four hundred times a day. Yeah, we scroll the height of Big Ben, you know, whatever the relevant mon monument would be in Germany, every day. So, what? Days? So we, we get it to you within eight hours. So we went through this process of fixing all the dysfunctionalities in the market to, to be the fixer brand. And we've had great success. We've moved from 16% decline in 2014 to 31% growth last year. So it's worked really well. Um, and it's, the great thing is it's permeated throughout the whole organization. Uh, what do I mean by that? So we heard about ads, acts, not ads. So I'll tell you a very, very small anecdote. I was sharing it with somebody last night, and we both agreed it was a killer. So maybe worth sharing. So there's a guy, one of our colleagues, who's on our Twitter handle, based in Leeds, sort of north-ish in, in England, um, answering, answering our tweets. And then one comes in, and it says, says, I'm really pissed off with Direct Line because my TV was stolen four days ago and, and I haven't had the replacement yet. Okay? Anyway, to cut a very, very long story short, this guy happened to be based, live close to Leeds. So our colleague, who the week before had had his training on fixing, what would Winston Wolf do? Logged out, drove home, picked up his TV, drove it to the customer's house. So the customer could watch the boxing fight that they'd wanted to watch that night, which was the reason they were pissed off. Amazing, right? And that was just because he understood what it was to be a fixer. So this is all great. Uh, next, next slide, please. This is all great, but it's still the case that people don't really care about insurance other than when they either make a claim or they buy. Uh, you know, why would they? We heard, you know, Tony's son didn't want to pay for his insurance, and, you know, why, why would you? It's a relatively low engagement category, given its cost and its importance. People don't want to have to pay it. They certainly don't want to have to use it. Okay? So the problem we had is, how do we have an, a conversation with our customers outside of the renewal process once a year, and outside of the claims moment, only 10% of people claim a year. So for the other 90%, all they know of us is, I want to buy it as quickly and cheaply as possible. Well, we want them to think more of us than that. So how do we have a conversation? How do we drive consideration for the brand on an ongoing basis? How do we permeate their thoughts when people don't really want to think too much about insurance? And so we realized what we needed to do, taking inspiration from Google, actually, who say, we, we want to fix some bigger problems in the world. 
Thank you. We want to fix some bigger problems in the world, you know, so they want to fix, you know, water shortage, um, internet connectivity around the world, uh, eternal life, and so on. Uh, and so we said, well, maybe we can't fix things like that. I mean, we're not going to really do anything around eternal life, for sure. Uh, but maybe we can find some things that need fixing in the world. Uh, so we went on a bit of a hunt about what would symbolize our high-performance insurance in another context. And so we decided to hack lights. Okay. So uh, in the UK, there's a whole bunch of lights on the streets. But when you take a step back, they're not very good. They're fixed. Yeah? They don't follow you around. You, you might happen to have a broken one on your street, and that encourages a mugger to find you there, or the road not, not, may not be very well lit, and you, uh, you know, therefore have a crash. But also, crucially, there's large parts of the country which aren't covered very well at all. And the sad truth is more people are killed on the roads in the winter months. Some of that is because the roads are wet, but a lot of that is because vision is impaired, because it's dark. So we decided that we would, we would hack lighting and, and try and find a way to do high-performance lighting. Um, and this, in the end, manifested as something that we called fleet lights. The first in what we're describing as a direct line initiative. At the very end, I'm going to give you a little bit of a peek of number two, which only launched last week. Um, but I'm just going to play this video so you can see what it entailed. Ever since I've been little, I've been very scared of the dark. You associate darkness with being unsafe. A regular shift here can be quite varying. The evenings and the week are a little bit quieter. It can be a little bit scary at times. A street lamp will only give you light so far, especially the street lamps around here. Typically, we get called out to find uh, vulnerable missing people. The time that we get the majority of our call outs is in the evenings. I suppose most of the areas that we get called to don't have particularly adequate lighting. It's often because street lighting is in the towns and cities. I definitely think that light is something that everybody needs, especially at night. It's just a source of comfort and a source of safety. The most dangerous element of driving to the call-outs at night is the unfamiliarity of the area. Just to have that extra set of lights to show you where the road is going, where the bends are coming up, it would just be really helpful. Light would definitely be more beneficial if it was available in more areas of the countryside. The ability to have the way lit out for you is, is something that's fantastic. Insurance, who'd have thought? So technically, that was a mashup of leading edge mesh network technology, so they don't bump into each other, some pretty leading edge drones, also LED to do, to do the lighting, and also GPS, because to make it work through your mobile, it needs some sort of bit of advanced GPS. Um, symbolically, it was much more than that. It was a step into the company that we believe that we need to become. So all insurers will say, we're going to move from a process of restitution actually into a service of prevention. So with AI and preventative analytics, insurance gets even more interesting because it will become a prevention service. You know, maybe some of you have seen the film Minority Report. 
you know, we're not talking about precog crime, we're, but we're talking about maybe stopping things happening before they happen. That's the trend. And this is a step into that prevention space that we know we're going to need to occupy as time comes through. In a world where, I'm told by 2028, one neural network computer will have the same processing power as a human being, and by 2048, one neural network computer will have the same processing power as all human beings' brains put together. You've got to recognise, I guess, that the world's going to move on from things going wrong to stopping things going wrong in the first place. So this is, symbolically, is really important for us. One really important point was uh, we got some criticism uh, internally uh, about, well, we, we, when are we going to sell these things? When are we going to commercially launch these? And the obvious answer was, well, we don't know. I don't know. But this is important because it's a, land, it's a milestone towards something else. So we said, we think by 2020, we think we might find a commercial application for this. So it would take, take three or so years to find a commercial application. Come back to that. So um, we then had to go through a process of sort of amplifying this. And the point of doing this was that we wanted to get brand fame, not for the sake of fame, not just for the likes and the shares, but to drive consideration. Remember the business objective? Drive consideration for the brand. Uh, and um, bring the brand promise to life and demonstrate in a much more textured way what the brand stood for. So we did a huge activation campaign on Facebook, Twitter, um, Google, uh, YouTube, etc. Um, as you'd imagine, uh, and, um, but not very much paid, and a, an amazing amount of earned media. From an ROI point of view, this is pretty stunning. Uh, and from uh, Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan to Australia, China, France, Venezuela, Russia, this thing went global. I mean, we didn't plan for it, and it's actually not even that useful because we're based in the UK. But anyway, uh, we got quite a lot of, of global coverage. Um, and in that sense, you know, it was surprisingly successful. And uh, I'm not going to do the whole numbers thing, but we got 17 million impressions. We paid for only a fraction of those. 11% increase in consideration, which was the business objective. So people saw this 11 times more likely to consider Direct Line as a brand for them. Um, and, and also, uh, without the numbers here, but a, a big reduction in people rejecting Direct Line. Um, so that's also very important. So this is, this is all fantastic, but remember I said you know, 2020 was probably you know, a bit of a punt as to maybe we'll find some commercial application. But we did the whole thing on an open IP basis, all open source. We, we said actually in the end, we're not going to manufacture drones, I mean, we're an insurance company. Uh, but we obviously had to par partner with a number of leading edge tech companies to pull this together. And this sent quite an interesting signal out to the world that this is the type of company that we are from a B2B sense. Um, so since then, we've uh, had really good conversations with Tesla, for example. We're not a company that Tesla would have wanted to work for or work with uh, until we did start to do this kind of thing. So it's, it's quite symbolic in that sense. Um, but also what emerged was uh, sea search and rescue companies approached us. We hadn't even thought of this use case. So if we're talking about useful brand experiences, this is what happened. Sea search and rescue came to us and they said, you know, our job is really tough. <laughs> When we're out at sea, and the waves are this high, and it's cold and wet, and it's dark, and our lights point in beams, it's really hard to find people, and they die. So we said, mm, we can help you with that. Um, so we actually, just last month, we gifted the whole project to Sea Search and Rescue in the UK. Um, and we're now working with them, developing the technology. And in, in a nutshell, we think it's going to be five times more effective at saving lives at sea than before. It's pretty cool. So let's, uh, let's play the second video. This is Caster on Sea in Great Yarmouth. Uh, this is Caster Lifeboat, the only independent lifeboat in the country. Uh, we're very proud of what facilities we have in Caster. The biggest problems we have is a mixture of everything really, you know, last week for instance we uh, were searching for a diver for 14 hours, we do have searchlights on the boat, they're quite limited, uh, if there's someone in the water then obviously the, the radar's no good, you just need to keep your eye out. 
The traditional method of the lifeboat going out, it will allocate a search pattern. So if they've got a person in the water and if the person's on the opposite side of a wave to them, they could be 20 meters away from the boat and they still don't see them. The mesh network system allows the drones to all communicate together and relays that information with the base system on the lifeboat. So now we can have multiple drones that can now be an eye in the sky. So instead of covering an area of maybe 50 square meters with the lifeboat, we can now cover 500 meters. The project with KSTA is a development from Fleet Lights in 2016, which was all about uh, high performance fixes to everyday problems, which is something really close to Direct Line's heart. This has naturally led us down this route into search and rescue as a result of open sourcing the code. And what it means now is we're able to provide our technology in order to find people at sea five times faster than they're currently able to. If we had a drill up uh, and search independently from us, basically we've got fantastic technology on the boat, but the best course of if you're searching for someone is your eyes, and the more eyes you've got searching the sea, uh, the better. You know, it's the future. So we thought it was going to take three and a half years, and it took less than six months to find the first practical application. But there, there are many more use cases that you can imagine, and the fact that we've done it on an open source basis is deliberate because we're not best placed to make the most of the technology. But of course, you know, I'm in marketing, so we want to make sure we leverage this, so we then got a second bounce of all the global publicity and media. Again, shifts in consideration, so you can see how dramatizing the brand promise actually delivers business results. And, you know, the growth story continues, and this is playing a role. It's not the only thing we've done, but it is, it is playing a key role in, uh, in our success. Um, and these, this, is, this is like, if anybody's watching Breaking Bad, this stuff is a bit like methamphetamine. You think, maybe we can attack some other problems. This is, you know, our business is now sort of fairly addicted to do some of these cool things. And so we said, right, well, what's the next thing? Because in the end, you know, drones are going to be of limited use in when people break down, for example. Um, some use, but not. So we said, well, what's the biggest fundamental problem that we can fix? And so we said, well, we need to hack roads, because all cars are on them, and we heard before about the problems that we have with mobility. If you think about roads, they were made many, many years ago, not for not the busy times that we have now, so with so many more pedestrians, so many more cars. They weren't built or designed for that. Um, they break, they're not very useful and helpful at all times, they can be misleading, they can cause accidents, so we need to hack roads. Um, again, at the beginning of the project, we had no idea really how to do that, but we knew we needed to work with some cool people to help us to get there. Um, so it's not the focus of this presentation, but what I did want to show is demonstrate that this is something that's repeatable. I'm going to play a very short clip of something we launched last week and then say a few words about it. So hopefully, final video. Our second initiative is the smart crossing. Uh, that's just a, one use case. There's many, uh, including much wider crossings, um, creating a halo of a, somebody walking out across a crossing so that people who are blind on the far side can see somebody coming into their path, uh, and so on. Uh, and it's a, it's a responsive, intelligent road with a combination of LED technologies. It's a very smart kit that surveys the road. And, um, you know, can distinguish a, an animal, a human, a, somebody on a bike, somebody on a motorbike, somebody in a car, somebody in a van, uh, to make some decisions about how to manage that environment. And we heard before, I mean, Tony, you set me up perfectly, you know, roads is the last form of transport not to be a managed service. Well, here you go. Okay, it's only a pilot. <laughs> so, <it's laughs> again, somebody might ask the question, when is this going to be in commercial use? Well, very interestingly, you know, there are some parts of the world which are much more progressive in terms of smart cities. You know, if you think of the UAE in particular and Saudi and so on, where, you know, because you could get this to a good scale cost, and it's probably more durable than normal roads. So I mean, I'm sure the economics can work, but there's a hurdle to get there. But imagine if we could make roads much, much safer. Remember the 20 million of the 17-year-old who put his three best friends into wheelchairs for the rest of their lives. I think it would be a good thing for society if we could make this into something mainstream. We don't know the how, 
but we know it would be good if we could get there. So, thank you for listening. This has been a story about a brand rejuvenating itself, finding its purpose, um, and working out how to extend that purpose into having a bigger reach. The learnings are kind of obvious, which is, you know, embrace ambiguity. We didn't know how we were going to get there. Work with great partners. But in the end, always root it back to the brand promise, and that will illuminate, excuse the pun, that will illuminate the way. Thank you for listening, and I'm very happy to take any questions.